Hey, God's peace be with you as we take a look at our first reading for this past Sunday, our fifth week in our Easter season, and we're looking at Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. Now, I know we haven't celebrated Pentecost, um, Pentecost proper within the church year, but this passage builds on um, what's referred to as the, 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 the Gentile Pentecost, where um, basically going back to the way in which Jesus reminded the disciples and the way Luke records in both the gospel as well as in Acts, to stay in Jerusalem and then you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Um, it, it, as, as this kind of a mission movement where you start with the people of, of the, the Old Testament people of God, the Jude Israelite nation, and then go to the Samaritans, which were sort of like a Métis mix, hybrid mix between um, going back to the t the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, where where basically um, the Jew people from the Israelites had intermarried with people from with women from other nations, and um, there was this push at that time to try and purify the nation of Israel. And it's not meant to be um, the, this this good thing, but this just this historical recognition that. That um, among the among the people of Israel, those who, who basically they were told, put away your wives if they're foreign wives and their children, and have nothing to do with them, and those that refused to do that basically became this this um, Samaritan community, where sort of like the the Métis um, of Western Canada, they they have um, cultural heritage both within Judaism as well as from other sources as well. But in this case, it moves beyond just the ones that are, you know, considered to be genetically pure Israelites to the ones that are considered to be the um, the, the, the half-breeds, so to speak, um, within that con cultural context of the world, um, to include um, people from completely outside, so what um, was commonly called Gentiles, which is basically people without any um, genetic connection to the people of Israel as descendants of Abraham. And as we hear this, um, where it fits in this is a reminder both of the work of the Holy Spirit that we hear about in our gospel reading, that it, um, the Holy Spirit's role is to direct us back to the words of Christ. But then also, also the other side is a reflection of what we've been hearing and seeing for the last little while in our, our second readings from Revelation, where the church consists of people from every language, nation, and tribe. And even though these are all New Testament passages, you hear that reflected throughout the Old Testament prophets, particularly Isaiah. And and this, as a result, as we read this, you know, it, it kind of builds on both of those themes, the work of the Holy Spirit, but then also, you know, the reality of the church is consisting of um, people from all nations so that we can't, um, as we're reminded today, draw ethnic and cultural distinctions within the church as though um, those are a lasting distinction when all have been baptized into Christ and carry the same gift and the same name. So as we begin, um, let's open again as always with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that um, even in our own day you leave these witnesses of how the early church struggled with causing, well, divisions within society. And as we take a look at that in our own day and age, as we encounter the various ways and people like to try and play identity politics and cause divisions based on this, that, and the other thing, that we're reminded through the words of the scriptures that we are to have no part in that, but instead embrace one another equally as, as fellow citizens of the kingdom of heaven, all through that common gift of the gospel and the washing of of our baptism. Bless us so that even in our own day we would have the same missionary zeal as the early church to be able to recognize that your church is built not only by our Lord as the cornerstone, but through that word as the Holy Spirit gathers us together into one family. So that looking always to Jesus as the one who builds the church and creates the church through that that, that gift and working of forgiveness, that we too would find ourselves actively reflecting that same love towards all those around us. This we pray for in his name. Amen. Okay, I have to begin also by pointing out this is not a how-to passage about how to have dreams and visions and to build your life upon those sorts of things either, even though 
there is a vision that Peter has that, that factors very large within this passage. Throughout the scriptures, um, and this becomes one of those sorts of things, I know that within charismatic circles and Pentecostal circles and those sorts of things, that it becomes this, this idea that, and I heard it even among some of the people, you know, some of these videos that circulated surrounding the, the freedom convoy, that God gave me this vision, and all this vision was about all of these sorts of things, and these things were going to happen. Um, nowhere do the scriptures teach that we are to build our faith and life around visions, but instead around the word of God. And the select examples of visions like this that are provided are given precisely because they're out of the norm, but at the same time confirmed by the whole church through the scriptures to point back to that work of Christ. And so, um, you know, as a general rule of thumb, and this is also something that's been passed down throughout history, this wild, wide recognition that visions and dreams could come from anywhere. Um, you know, Paul writing, even if an angel from heaven or what appears to be an angel from heaven were to come and preach a different gospel, don't believe them. Because we go back to that which we have for certainty through the eyewitnesses of Christ, which is, you know, not only the Old Testament prophets pointing the way to him, but then also the apostles and those who walked together with him and who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, teaching what Christ himself has taught. So as we listen to these sorts of things, um, you know, don't get caught up chasing after movements that try to claim that that, you know, you've got to have dreams and visions in order to really, really be in tune with God because um, that was never part of the early church or the way in which the church understood her work and mission. It's built on the word and the certainty and the truth, the pattern of sound teaching, the way that Paul writes. So here, Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, though. And this becomes an important place where the Holy Spirit does provide an extraordinary kind of a, an example because along the way as we hear these words it's it's basically the holy spirit confirming saying yes indeed in the same way that you received the holy spirit so too the gentiles have and that was brought back to the church as a whole in order to cut through the the way in which um you know the society at the time was divided between so many different cultural forms of identity politics then as well so now Chapter, or chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And that was a scandal. Okay? Because in, in, and if you read through the rest of the New Testament, particularly um, when you get to Paul's letters, that became this huge issue because along the way, um, even Peter got himself caught in between because along the way what ended up happening is, is that you know, the, the ones who figured that the gospel was for the Judaic inheritance and Israelites only, what are these Gentiles doing here? It became this really uncomfortable kind of a thing because within Israelite practice, particularly among certain forms of Judaism at the time, you just don't associate with those who are outside of the Jewish community. And you find that um, to some extent even within um, some modern forms of Judaism as well today. Because the more you associate with those who are outside, the more unclean you become. So here, you know, this message and this rumor that, you know, the word of God was received and brought to those outside of the, the historically Israelite community. How could that possibly be? And so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. So, and, and Luke uses this term, the circumcision party, being those that insisted that if you're going to become Christian, you have to be circumcised first, because first you have to become Jewish, and then you become Christian. Okay. So, um, and, and Paul deals with that throughout his letters as well. So Peter went up to Jerusalem, and those who were holding on to this, this, this far, far kind of a, um, you know, pure Israelite, uh, pure Ju Judaic kind of a, conception, they went and criticized Peter, saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. And that's a whole big faux pas, because you don't sit down and you eat with these people, because that means having fellowship with them and have, treating them as though they're the same family when they're not. Okay, so they thought. But here's the thing. Do we build on culture, or do we build on the work which God does in Christ through the means of his word, through baptism and communion. And of course, we lean on the latter, even though, even in our own age, 
You know, do we catch ourselves grumbling in the same way? Okay. Um, I'll pause here very briefly because um, one example, way back when I was going through seminary, um, church downtown, inner city church, the community it used to be one of these old historic churches in town in Edmonton, and the community changed around it so that most of the people that attended were historical families that attended the church. But this church really became an inner city kind of a community. And here along the way, as they're wrestling through this, trying to build a new identity, well, sure, they built up an inner city outreach, but but um, one day this fellow started attending church, street fellow, reeked a high heaven of body odor, but he would come, he would hear, he would listen, and he wanted to be baptized, and then take communion. And the pastor um, at the time basically had to deal with the congregation that was sitting there saying, how can we commune him? He stinks. So what? Okay, but he stinks. And I'm not saying the whole congregation was against the idea. Some saw it as a very, very real working of the Holy Spirit, um, bringing him to faith. But others basically complained. You know, we can't have him as a member of our church. And the question becomes, why not? Because through baptism, we're made members of the body of Christ, not based on, you know, how well we have access to clean water to wash ourselves or laundry facilities to clean our clothes or, you know, whether we live on the street or not and those sorts of things along the way. The gospel extends to all people and where the Holy Spirit creates repentance in order to bring them into the church, we honor that. Because otherwise we're sinning against the work of God, not only in Christ through baptism, but in the Holy Spirit in bringing people to faith. So here, <clears throat> so we listen to this, but the key is always repentance, okay? And we'll hear that at the end of our, our passage here today. And repentance, not in the sense of, oh, woe is me, uh, Monty Python style, where you beat yourself over the head with a wooden tablet in order to make yourself look like you're really, really sorry and you know, those sorts of things. Repentance being simply that return to the Lord and um, confessing our sins, honestly, not, not the sins that culture likes to make up, but the sins that are actually discussed in Scripture, so that we return both to ourselves, but then also to the Lord. Um, and ourselves not in the way that we want ourselves to be, but to ourselves in the way in which our Lord calls us to be. So here, Peter gets whacked over the head by this, un this party of the circumcision, saying, you went and you ate with these people. What's wrong with you? Okay. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. And so here, basically, Peter begins and tells the whole account. He says, I was in the city of Joppa praying, Joppa being a coastal town in the north of Israel, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Okay, and so he's explaining this based on what happened to him. Then here along the way, it says, looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Now we pause there. Now, as we hear this, reptiles, not something you eat in the Old Testament. They're considered unclean. Birds of prey, same kind of a thing. These are predatory birds. So you don't eat them and all these sorts of things along the way. And here he's got all these animals, a mixed bag. And the voice from heaven says, kill and eat. And according to Old Testament uh, rules of cleanliness, basically this was like, you know, give me the heebie-jeebies. It's like, you're asking me to do what? No, nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. It says, I haven't ever done anything like that. Why are you asking me to do this here in this dream? And so basically Peter responds and saying, by no means, no, Lord, what are you saying? But... Verse 9, the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean do not call common. Those words become important because how and where does God 
declare us clean. It's in the word of Christ, in the work of Christ, where we're washed and made members of the body of Christ so that there is neither Jew nor Greek, the way Paul writes about it, but we all are one in the same body together with our Lord and Savior, not by our external cultural backgrounds or cultural observances, but by specifically the work where God reaches out to us in the waters of baptism and makes us his own. Oh, pause. If God has washed us to make us his own, and he's not talking about you know, people in a vision and dream saying, God said I could do this. I heard that too growing up. You know, I can go and do these sorts of things, even though they go against what scripture says, because God told me that I have permission. It's like baloney. I'll use the more colloquial bullshit. If an angel comes from heaven and tells you a different gospel or a different teaching than what is there in the word, you know, don't follow them in the way Paul writes. No, we need the real Christ, the real word, the real teaching of God of what is right and wrong. Um, so that we build on a true confession of what is really a sin rather than simply conforming ourselves to whatever's popular in culture. And that becomes a challenge today, even the same way it was back then, where even within the church, um, where, you know, you'd like to say people that should know better, they still needed to be um, caught within the crosshairs of God's word to say, wait a minute, that, even though it makes sense to you, has no place here. Okay, That, even though it's popular, has no place here. But instead, we're brought together, Jews and Gentiles, by faith, by the one Savior, and the working of the Holy Spirit, all through the waters of baptism. So here, <clears throat> as we move along, so the voice of God answered a second time from heaven. We read this. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, he says, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And notice, all of those things that were in the sheet were covered by the same sheet. And you can see that as an image of baptism where we're all put into the same basket together with Christ. Um, and, and it was drawn up into heaven. That work of salvation, Christ's resurrection and his ascension into heaven, brings us into that everlasting communion with our Heavenly Father through Christ, regardless of our cultural background, or what language we have, or what color our hair is, or, you know, all those sorts of things where nowadays it becomes popular to divide people based on culture, and if you're the wrong culture, then you have to be apologetic for all these sorts of things along the way. You know, it's, it's a bizarre kind of a world where you're supposed to see culture, but you're not supposed to see culture. And if you see it in the wrong way or catch someone off guard, then you're absolutely wrong rather than learning to see one another through Christ who brings us all together apart, you know, regardless of our skin color. So this happened three times, he says. Okay, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold... At that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were and sent to me from Caesarea. All right, <clears throat> Caesarea being Caesar's city. Okay, so here, he's praying, the Lord provides this vision, and just as the vision wraps up, basically, you know, he's three, three men come and they call him over to this house in the region of Caesarea, a Roman city. And the, city, and the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. Okay, so in other words, drop all of your preconceived notions about who is clean and who is unclean. And that's very specific from the vision. Okay. So, as he goes along, he says, the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me. And so there were six um, from within the church that came with Peter we entered the man's house and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in this house to say send to joppa and bring simon who is called peter and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved you and all your household <clears throat> now
Now, can the Lord work through dreams and visions? Yes. Um, do we know of instances in the scriptures where this happens? Yes. This is certainly an exceptional one, which is recorded because it is exceptional. Does it happen in our world today? I won't say entirely no, um, but I think sometimes people look for dreams and visions in order to feel special rather than heeding the voice of Christ. <coughs> I do know that it does happen in the world today. Um, one of our sister churches in Germany, um, they, and this is, oh goodness, about 10, 15 years old right now, and um, the, we're working with a sponsor who has been connected with that church. Um, it was an older congregation, similar sort of a thing. Um, a you know, stubborn German group. All Germans are stubborn, but not just Germans. Okay, um, and say that with with all all love in our hearts. And part, you know, I'm mostly German as well, if not all German. So as we hear all of those words along the way, um, th this congregation was a dwindling congregation, you know, a biblical congregation. And one day, their pastor gets a phone call from or I don't know if it was a phone call or the people showing up, but this, this Iranian family, Farsi speakers, they say, I had a dream and the Lord Jesus told me I needed to come to this church. Tell me about who this Jesus is. Um, Muslim background country. And in the process, um, through this dream, they're brought, into the, in, brought to this pastor where the pastor preaches the gospel to them. And... You know, it's not the ordinary sort of run-of-the-mill things, but, um, you know, if they're here and they're asking about Jesus, it's likely something that's good. And this handful of people turned into a few hundred people over the years, over the, the decades, so that the church um, grew and had to expand uh, because of the work which the Holy Spirit was doing, bringing all these Farsi speakers from a Muslim-dominated country who had been moved over to Germany as refugees um, and who had come into contact with the gospel message and the Holy Spirit had given them faith. Um, did the congregation all rejoice saying, hooray? Um, no, um, apparently there were some that left because their nose was out of joint. You know, how can you have these immigrants come into the church? Don't you know where they come from? They're not as German as we are, and da, 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 these sorts of things. And yet, at the same time, um, the Lord knew what he was doing. We wrestle with these things today, even though we think we're so much more enlightened than the early church was, or we, we pat ourselves on the back over cultural things. We have to guard ourselves. We have to watch ourselves that we don't fall into that trap, because... In the same way as happened there in Germany, in the same way that happens within our own congregations here, where the Lord has brought, at least for our congregation, not only an Anuak community into our church, and they are part of our church, even though they, they wrestle and struggle with trying to figure out how to do things in a North American Canadian way. And you get that. Germans did that too when they came over and they wrestled with things as well. But they made a way. They made a way. Um, and then our church has not just those, but I have to, the Norwegians that I tease all the time, the Swedes, and then uh, I think we even have some Finns and Ukrainians and English people and, and Jamaicans and all of these people along the way in the church, where as we listen to that, Chinese as well. And so um, the Lord brings us all together into one family in Christ so that, you know, the old things that we use to separate ourselves they need to recede into the background in order to be embraced by the new thing where God calls us not uncommon, but common, clean, forgiven, all through the same word and the same, same waters of baptism. It is there that very much in the same way that in the early church, the church grew, that the church continues to grow in our own day and age and the Holy Spirit um, remains faithful to that in pointing people from all languages, nations, and tribes back to Christ. Woe be it to us to stand in the way. Okay. <clears throat> now, as we move along here, basically he's told to send for Peter in Simon, who's also called Peter in Joppa, Simon being his, his Hebrew name, um, whereas Peter is his Greek name, and basically says, he'll bring to you this message of salvation for you and your whole household. Notice he doesn't say only for the adults. He says, for you and your whole household. So as I began to speak, 
Peter says. He got there and the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And this was that exceptional example in order to highlight that, yes, indeed, these people have been called by the same word to the same Christ, by the same Holy Spirit, through the same waters of baptism, to be part of the church so that he wouldn't be caught up within that same old, um, you know, Judaic versus non-Judaic distinction that, that um, as we read through the New Testament, he stumbled in. Paul had to pull Peter aside and say, how come is it that you eat with the Gentiles until some of these people from the, from the group of the circumcision show up and then all of a sudden you ignore the Gentiles completely? So all these sorts of things. Even Peter had to be um, reproved by Paul along the way. So here, verse 16, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and no, this is not a statement talking about spirit baptism as separate from Christian baptism, but as a way to highlight that they too, Gentiles, received the same Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? So this is Peter's explanation. <coughs> and then <clears throat> the way that Luke continues to record this, points out saying, when they heard these things, and this is having this news brought back to church in Jerusalem, where really you can talk about it as the mother church, um, when they heard these things, they fell silent, saying, oh goodness, then perhaps there is something to this, rather than having the ones from the group of the circumcision simply criticize. They fell silent, and then instead they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has, notice these words, granted repentance that leads to life where it builds around repentance, where we return to Christ, where we're led by his word, and his word not in terms of visions and dreams, but his word in the scriptures, so that we come to him and are washed in the waters of baptism and made members of the body of Christ. And that the important word here too, not only is repentance that leads to life, but also that God has granted. And this becomes one of these interesting words along the way here. Sometimes we have this idea, and it comes through a lot of evangelical preaching along the way, which doesn't have any stake in, in seeing the sacraments as God's work or the word as God's work, but instead, this is what I tell you, now you have to decide. You have to decide for to follow Jesus, or you have to pray this prayer of commitment. None of these things are present in the New Testament, by the way. Um, you know, Acts doesn't say, okay, now that you've heard about Jesus, just fall to your knees and pray the following prayer of commitment. No, it's come and be baptized. Repent, believe, and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And the gift is for you and for your children. It always goes back to that gift of baptism where you receive the Holy Spirit. And repentance as well is the way that is clearly stated here, a gift from God. God granted it. Um, it's not a work that we perform in order to impress God, but instead repentance is that continuous working of the Holy Spirit, reflecting back on Sunday's Gospel reading, where the Holy Spirit leads us back to the words of Christ. The Holy Spirit leads us back to our Savior, again and again, through the Word, through the law as we come to recognize our brokenness and our sin, that mirror function of the law, but then back to the gospel where that forgiveness is always renewed and strengthened in our lives, the way in which Christ himself gives it, so that we build on Christ and we learn to leave aside all of those things that, you know, we, we have a tendency to build our lives around. And that's a hard pivot to make and a hard transition to make because it seems like it's so reckless, or it seems like it goes against all of the things that we build our pride and identity around. You know how that works? You know, our pride is a terrible thing, and as soon as the Holy Spirit tries to move us away from that, we all of a sudden say, oh my goodness, oh no. Um, we need to be able to 
recognize when that happens as the Holy Spirit is prompting us and leading us back to Christ so that we hold on to and build on what Jesus gives and the way that he continues to help us to grow or the way that we heard yesterday in our epistle reading, Revelations reading, behold, I am making all things new. And that's part of that making all things new, which Christ does within our lives as he continues to give us his Holy Spirit through word and sacrament so that we build on what he has done rather than on in our culture this is the way we've always done things this is the way my family did and i'm not quite sure and i don't quite know if i like that or you know what are those people going to do because they're different and that means that i might have to change yeah that's okay but what are we building on and where's the holy spirit moving us not to move us away from scripture but to move us deeper and deeper into that mystery and that gift of what Christ is doing in and through the word, in and through baptism, where he calls us from every nation, every tribe, to be part of that one body in Christ, to build that family that is there in that new Jerusalem, that heavenly city, where we stand around the Lamb on the throne who makes all things new, who died by whose blood we are ransomed from every nation, tribe, and language to be part of one family together in him. So we listen to this then, like I said, it's not a how-to about how to pursue dreams and visions, but instead it's returning back to the word, returning back to the work of Christ, returning back to our baptism, returning back to that, you know, that reality that all of the things that we hold on to here on this side of eternity, they will cease to exist. They'll pass away. But what goes on for eternity is the work that Christ performs as he brings us together from every language, nation, tribe into one new family so that when the church grows, instead of you know standing there saying, I wonder what's going on, or when someone from a different culture or socioeconomic group comes in, we say, I wonder what's going on. I'm not sure I like this. But instead, we learn to look through the eyes of faith and rejoice that the Holy Spirit is working in their lives, in our lives, in our midst, in order to build the church on Christ, the cornerstone. Christ is risen from the dead first fruits of those who have fallen asleep and he is our hope and so let's build there amen <laughs>